I'd like to thank our guest today, Stephanie Hayes, who I'm sure most of you know is a columnist for the Tampa Bay Times, a very good columnist, I might add. And, and when I read Stephanie, you feel like you are talking to her because she's very funny and very informal. And I, I was thinking you're, I don't know, you can, maybe he's been an idol of yours, but uh, very much like Dave Barry from the Miami Herald. Very yes. funny and, and matter of fact. And uh, she had one in the paper today, um, but she'd had it online before because she puts out a newsletter called Stephanately, which is, a, is, is a, you get to read her columns before they come in print. And it was about an Airbnb and we've all stayed at Airbnb so we can all relate to what Stephanie wrote about it. So I will defer to her. She can tell us where she was born, where she grew up and, uh, and go on. And, and she'll give us a little history of herself and what she has to put up with at the Times. And then um, we'll open it up to questions. I'm sure most of us probably read the paper, either get it in print or online. So I'm sure most of you hopefully have read her columns before. So Stephanie, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me today. It's nice to be in front of all of you um, on Zoom. It's amazing the things we can do now virtually. We've become proficient at over the past few years, unfortunately, but also some benefits, I think. Um, thanks to David for reaching out to me. He emails me frequently. He's one of my nice readers who stays in touch and um, love hearing from different folks who read the column on a regular basis. Um, as he said, I'm a columnist at the Tampa Bay Times. I write uh, two columns a week, give or take, sometimes more, sometimes less. They're in print on Wednesday and Sunday, and then they go online usually a day or two before that on tampabay.com. And then, as he mentioned, I have a weekly newsletter that comes out on Monday, and that has kind of a bonus column in it that you don't always get. Sometimes I reuse them as the newspaper column, but that's only about once a month. Most of the time the newsletter's exclusive, bonus stuff, and then I'll link everything I wrote from the week and do other fun things like book recommendations or funny links or whatever is weird stuff's going on in my life. So that's uh, my professional life now. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how I got there. Um, I was born in the Cleveland area, Lorraine, and uh, I know Richard here on the call, <laughs> know some of my family from that part of the world, which is cool, small world, big family, small world. Um, born in uh, Lorraine, Elyria, Ohio, up by the Cleveland area. And my mom was a teacher and my dad was a respiratory therapist. Uh, so some medical connection there. And uh, one brother and we moved to Florida when I was 11. My mom and dad wanted new opportunities um, just to kind of break away and see what was out there for them. So um, my mom thinks in retrospect that my dad ended up having a massive heart attack when I was 14 and we were living here. He had a sextuple bypass, he had six. <laughs> um, and in hindsight, they think that maybe something was telling him to get out of the snow, you know, cause he probably would have keeled over shoveling snow. <laughs> so anyway, we got to Florida and I, um, I had, uh, I graduated from high school here locally in Pinellas County, and then I went on to St. Pete College and the University of South Florida. I don't have a fancy journalism pedigree. A lot of my colleagues um, have much more impressive schooling than I do. And in fact, even the interns that we hire now come from Northwestern or Indiana or, um, you know, really high quality journalism schools. Me, I didn't know you know, we didn't have a ton of money to send me anywhere like that. Um, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do other than that I liked to write. Writing was the thing I was always best at. So I um, just went to junior college. I was working at the mall in a music store and kind of thinking, what do I want to do next? I want to write. And then I thought, okay, well, where do people get paid to write? And I thought newspapers pay people to write. <laughs> so I started applying for jobs at the times, um, jobs that I was in no way qualified for. Um, and then eventually a job came open called editorial assistant. And that is, we don't really even have them anymore, but this was 2003. Um, I started when I was 19 and I'm 39 now. So it's been almost 20 years. So in um, 
2003, I applied for editorial assistant job, which is like a kind of an office assistant, a gopher, you know, <laughs> running around doing stuff for reporters. Um, and then if you kind of can string three words together and show up regularly and, you know, take showers, like they'll just start giving you more and more stuff to do. So uh, I was able to write small things like calendar listings for lunches or, you know, accident, traffic accident reports. Um, and that graduated to, I would go pick up zoning applications from the county center and write about, you know, who wanted to um, change the setback of their fence. Very like minute stuff that we don't really do anymore. But in the neighborhood sections, we did a lot of this. So that's kind of how I got started writing. And then, you know, eventually something happens in the newsroom and then the editor looks up. And if you're the only one sitting there, that like, it's like you go. <laughs> so I got to go on different assignments. And, um, you know, if there was breaking news, I got to run on it. And I remember my first 1A story. I mentioned my, my dad worked in um, hospitals. He worked for Meese Countryside and uh, it's Bay Care now, I think. Um, and he had mentioned over dinner one night that um, they had banned, you remember those Livestrong bracelets, the Lance Armstrong ones, the yellow ones? Um, they had banned those at the hospital because they were the same color as the DNR bracelets. So they, <laughs> so they didn't want to accidentally unplug anybody with a Livestrong bracelet. So they banned the uh, Livestrong bracelets. And I just went in and I mentioned this in the newsroom. And that was that became a story that I reported out and wrote. And it was my first front page story. And I was 19 or 20. So that was really exciting. So I kind of caught the bug um, at that point. And um, learned on the job. And then I uh, transferred over to USF to finish out my journalism degree. And all the while I was working at the Times, I never wrote for the school paper because I was writing for the big paper in town. Um, so it was kind of neat because I got to like skip some classes because I was already actually doing the work. Um, so uh, from there, I ended up covering, I got hired as a um, part-time reporter covering the West Chase neighborhood in Hillsborough for a while. Um, and then my first full-time job at the Times was writing obituaries, uh, which is not anything I ever really wanted to do, but I really um, kind of had developed a knack for feature writing, and we were introducing this new job where we would um, take a, a regular paid funeral notice and then report it out and write the fuller story of somebody's life. And the series is called Epilogue. We still do them. We have a writer named Kristen here who does them now, um, but I was the first one to do those. And uh, I was approached and asked if I wanted to do it. And I thought, I would think I was 25 at the time and I had no interest in writing about death, but <laughs> I also wanted a full-time job and it was feature writing and it allowed me to move into our main office downtown. And so I gave it a shot and it was actually a really interesting, um, difficult, informative job that really taught me a lot about how to be a journalist and how to ask questions and how to talk to people and um, difficult times and then how to get 10, 15, 20 pages of interviews and then condense it down into something this big. And I did that every day for about a year and a half. And I think I wrote 350 of those um, until I sort of burned out on it because it was a lot of death. I remember thinking, um, you know, how like when you're in your mid twenties, you might hear a song on the radio and think that it's your wedding song or something romantic. I would hear a song and think that oh, this would be nice at my funeral. <laughs> I think that was the moment when I was like, I have to stop doing this. So I switched out and I did a bunch of other beats. Um, I, let's see, I don't know. I moved into our TBT, which was our entertainment um, lifestyle tabloid and did pop culture reporting for a while. I covered higher education. Um, I was general assignment, which is just a fancy word for whatever. So you kind of catch everything that doesn't, uh, is not on someone else's beat. Um, so I've covered plenty of crimes and fires and court cases and everything like that. Um, and, and then I uh, got back to feature writing as a performing arts critic for a couple years, which was a lot of fun and also very informative. So I got to go to plays, uh, the theater and the opera and the orchestra and um, write reviews and interview performers. And that was very fun. And then at that point, uh, it, my editor got a different job and her job came open. And once again, I was approached um, at, at the Times and they asked if I wanted to go into editing and management. Um, and I have a history of getting asked to do things I haven't thought about and saying yes, and it seems to have worked out for the most part. Um, that's kind of been the 
tra trajectory of my career up to that point. <laughs> so I said, yes, I started running our, um, I started as an editor in our features department, um, which is our food coverage, our um, theme parks, music, um, performing arts, movies, all that kind of stuff. Um, and eventually worked my way up until I was running that department. And I was on the masthead with the top editors at the paper, um, kind of on the ladder to go up as high as I wanted to at the time. And it was in 2019 uh, in the winter, we had a retreat at uh, my editor had put our, our executive editor, Mark, who I think has talked to you before, um, had a retreat for his editors. At, and we just talked about like ways to make the paper better and what our goals were for the year. And, you know, one of the topics that came up was just adding a new uh, voice into our mix of, of opinion writers and columnists. And um, my friend Ellen, who's another editor at the Times, who ha currently has that job I was in, but I swear she wasn't setting me up. <laughs> it looks like that in hindsight. She said, um, I really miss your writing style, like I, you know, to me. And I, um, I think you would, it would be nice to hear you, your voice again. And I hadn't really thought about it. I had been editing for about five years at that point, four years, five years. And I hadn't really thought about it, but I went home and I, I, I thought, you know, she's right. And you mentioned Dave Barry. That was someone I really admired um, all through my life. I used to read his columns with my dad. We had books. And um, and at one point, I remember wanting to do that for a job and, you know, that being one of my goals. And it just sort of fell off as other stuff came. And so I, that, the next day or the next week, I went to Mark and I said, you know, what do you think about me <laughs> doing this? And um, and I said, I I I'm interested in being a columnist, but I don't want to be a columnist in the way that, you know, everyone else has done it. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. And there's a really important function of that kind of columnist who's like covering City Hall and, you know, holding noses to the grindstone. But I'm like, that's not me. I want to write something fun. I want to write about sort of the evergreen ties that bind us together. Um, and I want it to be a, a lighthearted place where I can also be serious if when the time comes. But um, I wanted to have a lot of voice and attitude and I, I want it to be very different. And I, I gave him some samples of writing I'd done over the years and, um, you know, maybe a list of ideas. And he was like, let's go, let's do it, you know, um, to his credit. He said, let's try it out and see. And so that was, that was the end of 2019. Uh, he said, you can start in March, 2020. <laughs> so <laughs> you could start your humor column in March, 2020. <laughs> So the end of 2019, I wrap up, I, I go away for Christmas, come back, um, wrap it up with my team, transition to Ellen, my friend who took over the team. And uh, I was all set to, we were going to, my husband and I were going to take a break. Um, I, we were going to go to Spain. We had been planning this trip for a really long time. It'd been on our bucket list. We had tickets to Spain. And when I got back from Europe, I was going to start my new career. <laughs> and then it was that time when, you know, COVID was sort of spreading through Europe and everyone, you know, if you were traveling, it was like, should I, shouldn't I, I don't know. Um, it was getting worse in Italy all the time. And so there was like a, a week and a half of this torture. Am I going to go on this trip? And then I think we all remember that point where it became clear, like, no, no one's going anywhere. <laughs> so we canceled our trip. Um, it was the last day of my job as an editor, but I had no vacation to go on. And I hadn't started my job yet. And I knew in a week's time, I had to start writing jokes and the world was shutting down <laughs> and it was terrifying and people were dying. And I was like, holy crap, what am I, what did I just get myself into? So I remember having this week where I was just on the couch with no, like unemployed basically, because my other job had ended and my new one hadn't started and I was not on my trip. And I was just sitting there watching TV, panicking and um, I didn't know what to do. And uh, my friend Helen, who is our food critic, uh, said, have you read, have you read the book One Dead in Attic by Christopher Rose? He was um, a columnist at the Times-Picayune in New Orleans during Katrina. He was their columnist ahead of time, but he lived through Katrina and wrote all the columns. And she's like, you know, read it yesterday. So I got it on my Kindle and I read it right away. And that book was really important for me because he's not a humor columnist, but he basically, um, what he did during Katrina was he just walked through that disaster with the people as one of them, you know, and it wasn't, his columns were not 
they didn't have answers. They weren't, you know, he wasn't expected to know what to do, but he simply walked through the wreckage with people. And I thought, okay, that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to walk through this really strange experience with readers and talk about the weirdness of it, the challenges of it, um, the little moments of joy. Um, and I'm just going to try my best. And so I remember I came back early because I didn't want to be off anymore. It was just too weird. Um, and I wrote, um, I think my first column was like, I'm your new columnist and I'm sorry, everything's terrible. Or something like that. <laughs> just wrote about how bad it was out there. And we're going to try to laugh and we're going to try to do it together and we'll see how it goes. And um, that was March, 2020. And now it's August or July, 2022. So I've been doing it that long. Um, and the column's done really well. People actually, turns out, really needed to laugh during those times. And we still do. Um, they almost needed like permission to laugh, you know, or a license to find some joy in a bad situation. And so I was able to connect with a lot of people. And, um, you know, it was a lot of, a lot of COVID columns for, for the first year or so. And then um, finally was able to get back out and get vaccinated and go out into the world and um, start, you know, meeting more people, which was one of my initial goals, like to write about people and to go experience things with them um, through a columnist lens. And um, so now it's a variety of stuff. I write about all kinds of whatever, you know, strikes me from week to week. Sometimes the ideas run over, other times they don't and I'm panicking. Um, more often than not, there's always something to write about and the readers are great. Um, it's a ton of fun. You know, I sometimes think about going back into management and I'm just like, I don't know why I would do that right now, <laughs> having the time of my life. And um, yeah, that is my story. That's how I came to be in this job and to do what I do now. And I would love to answer any questions that you all have or just talk. Stephanie, I, I know you have, uh, you have a family of a husband and a stepdaughter, I believe, mm -hmm. correct? Right. How do you, do you use them for ideas? Do you, I know, I know you've written about family trips and, mm -hmm. and experiences and how do they take to what you write about them? And is there, I mean, does your husband mind if you make him look a little silly sometimes or? Uh, no, oh, sorry, my lights just flickered. <laughs> no, he's in the other room right now. He's the journalist too. Um, he, he's our digital, he's one of our senior digital editors. Um, our senior digital editor. So he runs our website, our social media operation and a bunch of other things, but he's been a lifelong journalist too. And um, he gets it. <laughs> and I think he likes to be in the column. Like he, you know, he's, he'll be the first one to throw himself in for a joke. Um, so he has no problem with that. And we do, I try to draw from my family life quite a bit, um, you know, in that Irma Bombeck kind of vein. Um, so with him, it's no problem. With my stepdaughter, I do, I'm a little more careful. She's 11 and she, um, you know, she has a mother and a stepfather in her other house. And I never want to be disrespectful, you know, to them or anything like that. And um, I also want to protect her. So I don't use her name. I don't use her picture. You know, I will refer to her sometimes. I also don't want to, um, you know, I don't want to embarrass her. She's, I mean, we remember being 11. That's a tough age <laughs> and, um, and all this surrounding age. Um, so, you know, I try to make sure anything I do with her isn't too over the top um, and she's not, you know, won't look back at it and hate me, <laughs> but I try to be careful with her. Um, you know, I don't put her picture on my, I have publicly facing social media, like on Twitter and Instagram. Um, my Facebook is, I have a Facebook where I post my columns that I, I have my other one, which is private, you know, just for people I know and I'll post her there, but I try to just be more careful when it comes to her. And then if she gets a little older and wants to be the subject of something that's different, you know, cause she's kind of in control there. But um, yeah, I try to look to my family life and I think it's important to, for the type of column I'm writing to let people know that I'm a human with the family and, um, and we do the same things that you do. I go to the grocery store. I, I, you know, I think things cost too much, you know, right now too. We have school drama, we have, you know, family vacations that you might learn something from or get an idea from. So um, I try very much to be just a regular person and that involves, you know, talking about my family sometimes. Does she, I assume she reads your columns. Does she ever, no, she, she doesn't. doesn't. <laughs> I was going to wonder, does she ever come, to, I don't know if she calls you mom or Stephanie, but does she, ever, Steph, yeah. does she ever she calls come me to Steph you and go, <laughs> does she come to you and go, 
I just read it, Steph, you know, like one of those, <laughs> my God, how did you say what you said? Or No, you she gets bored. She picks up the paper sometimes and is just like, eh, she doesn't really care. She has more important. She's got to play Roblox and <laughs> play soccer and she's got things to do. All right. I think All Bruce, right. you, Bruce, you had a question. Yeah, uh, Stephanie, thanks so much for coming on. It, it's a fascinating insight into your world. I'm just curious, do you ever do you have a favorite comic or comedian or a late night talk show kind of person? Or mm -hmm. do you go to do you go to side splitters and check out the local comics? Do you, what, do you get any insight from those kinds of resources, so to speak? It's been a it's been a long time since I've been to side splitters. Um, but I do, I have been. Um, and I do love stand-up. We watch stand-up a lot, mostly on Netflix and um stuff at home. But um, we, my husband and I were just watching the George Carlin documentary. It's on HBO, it's two parts, um, as a, you know, a classic gold yeah. standard. But recently I went to a stand-up show of, his name is Nate Bargatze. Um, and he is hilarious. He's one of my favorites. He, um, he's from Tennessee. So in his um, country, but he, um, he writes very much, or he, he, his jokes are very much about like real life. And um, somebody's TV is on. Somebody have their audio on in the background. Um, Richard, do you have anything on? No. I think it was, don't, yeah. We don't got blame it. me immediately. <laughs> well, you're the only right, one who, just, Hunter, do you have anything on? You're, you're not. No, it's, it's quiet where I am. It's good. He got it. It's taken care of. All right. Anyway, Nate Bargatze is great. He talks about like very family stuff. It, he, or, it's it's pretty clean, but it's funny. It's not, a, you know, really vulgar or anything, which I like because you can watch it with your kids on in the room. Um, but he like the, one of his favorite, one of my favorite skits that he did when I saw him was he talked about being the person who has to bring the bag of ice to a party and you know, how that's just the worst, like the short straw. <laughs> and you never know whether to bring, it's either you either bring one bag and it melts right away, or you bring 20 bags and there's three drinks and <laughs> stuff like that. He's one of my favorites, but. Stephanie, I'm sorry. I, I missed, I missed who you were talking about. Nate Bargatze, B-A-R-G-A-T-Z-E. Okay. So look him up if you like that kind of stuff. Some of your yeah. stuff reminds, I just listened to some of uh, uh, John Mulaney. Mm -hmm. uh, I like some of the stuff you write reminds me of uh, yeah, yeah Mulaney yeah, yeah I like that. that type of comedy that's very much in the daily life vein rather than overtly political or um, you know I I like to listen to all of it but I really resonate with people who just talk about the absurdity of daily life because there's so much that's <laughs> ridiculous yeah. just about the the boring stuff in life you said you uh, you did some editorial work um i don't know if you were i write letters frequently to the paper and dr shepherd also writes and sometimes we combine our thoughts to to get a letter and can you tell us how they how the editorial department works i mean i know some of my letters get changed around they'll, they'll leave out a few words and i understand that for uh, shortness sake and, and brevity's sake and grammar and things like that but how do they determine letters that go in so i actually can't tell you that because i i haven't worked with the editorial department I, I said editing that's probably what you heard um but i have not been on the editorial board and it's a different department for me um fun, funny enough i was invited to be on the editorial board and i declined <laughs> because when you're on the editorial board you're part of a collective of opinions you know so if you read an editorial from the times there's a list of names at the bottom and it's supposed to be the all-encompassing view of the editorial board. And frankly, sometimes we run editorials that I don't agree with. And I just wanted freedom to not have my name in that pot, you know, if I had a different take on something. Um, so I didn't want to do that. Um, I, I don't know the process. I mean, I know the guys who, um, you know, who are the editors over there, Graham Brink and Jim Verhulst, um, who would probably be great people for you to invite in if you want to talk more about that process. But um, yeah, Jim is actually Jim is going to come on. Oh, well, then he, he'll be the one to answer this question for you. Um, but I know um, that, you know, it's difficult. They have to wade through a lot of um, feedback from readers and letters and um, weigh a lot of different things when they're approaching their job. And really what I wanted to do was have more fun than that. So <laughs> I said, you all can keep that. Do you ever but come Jim up with deadlines? He's wonderful. 
Do you ever come up against a deadline and go, oh my God, I don't know what I'm going to do. Or I've mm -hmm. only got, you have a <laughs> certain time that you like to write <laughs> that you set aside. It depends. I've always been a little bit of a procrastinator. So I get my, I, I, sometimes I'll get a really strong wind right before, you know, things are due. Um, I try not to do that too much because I've been an editor and I know like, I know the pain of somebody filing a story at 6 p.m. on Friday when like you want to go to happy hour too, you know, <laughs> they just drop it and leave you with it. So I try not to do that to my editor too much, but um, I, you know, I do sort of, I do, I mean, part of the writing process is not writing, you know, part of the writing process is like walking around and wondering what you're going to write and doing something else and getting ideas and getting out there and, you know, um, uh, sometimes my best ideas will come when I'm not just sitting here trying to have an idea. Also, the computer has so many distractions. It's hard to get inspired when you're, you know, just filing through a million little tiny bits of information. So um, it looks different every week. Every now and then I get the voice of God and it just comes down in me and I just like barf it out and it's done, you know, <laughs> like, and I'll turn it in. I did that a couple weeks ago where I had already turned in a column and then something struck me and I just literally wrote another one while the editor was still editing the other, the first column. And she was like, what are you doing to me? <laughs> I said, sorry, when it happens, you have to grab the inspiration. You know, if you go, oh, I'll do that next week. It'll be gone. Um, who's, so who's your yeah, editor? El, El, who's your, Ellen's your editor? Um, my editor's name is Claire McNeil. Um, hmm. But Ellen does edit me sometimes when Claire's off and she was that week and she's my very good friend. So we can sort of tease each other. Um, but, do you ever write one that they go, no, that that's, we don't it's think. It's happened to me maybe once. Um, usually there's, I mean, everything gets edited, you know, and changed and refocused sometimes. Um, or just word, like we're very big on word choice. You know, my current editor is just masterful with language. So, you know, if I have the verb um, or if I have it as the subject ever, she's just like, what is it? You know, and I have to find a better, we have to, find stronger verbs all the time, you know? Um, so we're always doing work like that. Um, but I've only had one, I think that we were just like, nah. And it was very political and I really, that's not, I, I have written political things and I do sometimes, but it's not really the wheelhouse that I wanna stake my claim in, you know? And so we just sort of decided like, I don't think this is the road you wanna go down. Um, so we didn't do it, but it was a decision in concert. It's never like, this is horrible. Try again. You know, it's a kind place. It's we work together. We come to consensus. And do you? Uh, if anybody else has any questions, let me know. But I've, I've got a few. Do you use um, Grammarly when you write by any no. chance? No, I use this. <laughs> Just all up there. Okay. Well, I yeah. do have right on my desk here. If you like grammar, it's a daily calendar. It's Benjamin Dreyer's um, grammar calendar. Oh, cool. I don't know where the cover is. Hold on. Oh, I have it. Is the it interesting thing, the interesting Dryer's thing English? about uh, the, uh, the Smith, the Hayes family, the, uh, her extended family is even those who showed no talent in school whatsoever, they could write, they could speak, and they do it as a habit. And uh, it always fascinated me. Her, her cousin, Don, who was not a great student, uh, he keeps travel logs. He he writes sports opinions. He uh, he's he's very much into writing, and I have I have a feeling that there's a genetic basis for your uh, your talent. And thank you. You wrote about choice. I think mm -hmm. it was about a month or so ago, and mm -hmm. it was not your usual column. It was profound. It was very well written. I was just I was stunned by it because I was expecting something lighthearted and funny yeah. but no you you hit the nail on the head with that Thank and I was you. just very impressed with that that was and, um, um uh I appreciate that you know I think one of my challenges as a columnist is finding a way into a topic that's not the same thing that everyone wrote because immediately when something happens it's there's there's a hundred different hot takes from people and a lot of them have a sameness to them um and I could easily just hop the, on that you know <laughs> That yeah. wheel and get lost and I think often it's a lot harder to just, like sit on your hands for a minute and really think what can I bring to this you know whether it's a humorous perspective or not I think 
in order for something to be special, it has to be different, you know? So um, sometimes I don't write on stuff at all. If it's like, if I don't have anything unique to say, um, I'll just let someone else have that, you know? But in that one, I felt personally um, connected to it in a way that I don't think I had read that I wanted to read. Do you get any reader feedback on that article or do you get reader feedback? Yes, I love what you're doing. No, don't, feel, mm -hmm. don't say that. Oh yeah, <laughs> you should see my inbox. I was just telling, um, I have a literary agent for my uh, outside writing pursuits and she was commenting on people. She, she has to reject people all the time, you know, and they just have the thinnest skin and they can't take it and they write back these mean things. And, you know, I said, well, you should be a journalist for even a year and <laughs> see how um, I have like, I have skin like a a whale shark, you know, <laughs> can take anything you tell me. It's fine. Um, but yeah, I get a lot of feedback. Most of it is very friendly. Most readers who write me are, are sweet. They're thoughtful. They like, um, they like what I do. Um, whenever it's something a little bit political, there's always people who get in there and, you know, um, don't agree. And it's, it, and if you email me and just don't agree, that's completely fine. And I always have a respectful exchange with people who are polite and, you know, just want to express a feeling when they're insulting or um, offensive or abusive. I just don't even reply and I block them because my time and my energy and my mental health are capital, you know, <laughs> so I just don't have time for trolls. But no, if, if you know, most, I would say 90% of the email I get is very thoughtful and supportive. And I have people who email me every week, <laughs> every week they email me um, and they end up telling me, just stuff about their lives, you know, they bought a camper, or look at this moth I found in my backyard, or you know, stuff like that, which is nice. Um, so yeah, I get a lot of different feedback on that one. I, I was kind of certain things I write, I'm braced for more um, negative feedback on. Um, but that one, I, you know, I got a couple emails who just didn't, didn't agree with the right to choice. And, um, you know, I can't do anything about that. But most were very supportive and they appreciated hearing that point of view. And, um, you know, I do always try to write from a place where if I am expressing a strong opinion, I'm going to try to do it in a way that's sober and that's respectful for the most part. And that is, or disarming, you know, and it's going to make people sort of stop and go, Oh, I at least see where she's coming from, you know? So. Can you come in on your freelance work at all? Have you written a book or mm -hmm. are you, uh, are you yes. a stringer for anything that we would have heard about or doing a, uh, a podcast or anything like that? Um, so I, in my spare time, I write fiction. So I wrote a novel. It's been about 10 years. It's called Obituary. Um, I have it around here. It's not in arm distance, um, but it's kind of a mystery novel. Um, I wrote that about 10 years ago and then sort of got off of fiction for a while when I was doing editing and management because it's, it's funny. I thought when I was an editor, I would have more free time to write because I wouldn't be writing all the time, but it's not, it wasn't true at all. It was much more demanding of my energy and creativity. And um, only when I started writing again in the past few years did I feel the itch to write fiction again. So I started writing fiction again. I wrote a new collection of short stories that um, I'm currently trying to get published, uh, but it's it's a long road. It sometimes takes months, even years to get a book published. And that's after you spent months and years writing it. Um, so there's a lot of rejection in the industry and a lot of waiting and a lot of patience. And um, it's really a you sick use an Asian, mm -hmm. You use an Asian though, right? Correct. Yes. Um, so it's a perverse hobby. You really have to want to write a book in order to do it. Um, there's a lot of things you could do that are more quickly fulfilling than writing a book, but I still love it. And then I'm writing another one just because they say when you are on submission with publishers, you should just be working on something else because that's the best thing to do because otherwise you'll just dwell and, um, you know, always have something new in the works. So yeah, that's what I do. Um, and then I don't do any freelance work. I'm, I am syndicated uh, via Creator Syndicate. So my, they take my column out uh, once a week. I send them one. I usually write one that's more local to Tampa Bay and then one that's a little more broad. And I send them the broad one and that goes out to different papers around the country. It's not that many. It's not like the Dave Barry days when he was in 500 papers because there's just not that many papers anymore, but um, it does go out to some places. Um, 
Yeah, that's it. Stephanie, you're, we're being a little dis, uh, little deceptive because when when I, I heard Stephanie on a podcast from a couple of weeks ago, and she mentioned her book, and now that she says she wrote obituaries, I of course looked up the word obituary novel and couldn't find it because it was spelled O B I T C H U A R Y. Mm -hmm. Can you and the, the, can you <laughs> tell us about? I know, right? Can you tell funny. us about the the premise of the book, because it was very interesting. I'm going to get the book and read it. It really sounded pretty cool. Um, yes, it was inspired by my time writing obits in <clears> real life, but it's fiction. Um, and the premise is that a young woman goes on a date and accidentally kills her date and hides it and has to write um, his obit. <laughs> and it's a mystery and a lot of wacky stuff unfolds till you get to the conclusion. So. Good. Yes, and it's yes. available on Amazon. It's on Amazon, yep. Yeah. But you have to spell it correctly. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> anybody else have any um let's see. Well other you, questions I, I have. I wanted to you you Dave compares you to uh, Dave Barry, but I I thought of Daniel Ruth and I didn't know if you had any interactions with him. And uh, I know your column isn't like his exactly, but he wrote a few uh, mm -hmm. that I thought of you when I thought back on those uh, articles and I wondered if he had any, uh, you had any kind of relationship with him. I know Dan, um, he's a great guy. Um, and I share your fondness for his column. Um, he hasn't really like sat down and molded me or anything like that. You know, nobody really has. Um, I've also met Dave Barry, who was very nice. Um, and I have been a lifelong fan. Um, I read a lot of columnists. I don't, you know, one columnist who I have spoken to personally, who I got a lot from was Mary Schmeek. She's retired from the Chicago Tribune. She retired last year. Um, she's a Pulitzer winner. Um, she wrote one in the 90s that was like one of the first viral columns before even the internet. Um, it was about wearing sunscreen. It was made into a song in the 90s. Um, but she, she, just gave me a lot of inspiration and um, good advice. Um, I like Alexandra Petrai at The Post. She just came back from maternity leave. She's their satirist or their humor columnist there. Um, and then I like a lot of modern essayists too who aren't in newspapers, like um, Samantha Irby and different people like that. Um, so I look to a lot of different writers. Um, and I also, when I'm, when I'm experiencing writer's block, I find it really helpful to read other columnists and it kind of will help jolt me out of it. Um, Mary Schmeek, who I mentioned, has a column that I have her book that I go to a lot. And um, she, one of my favorite ones is basically where she wrote about have, having nothing to write about on deadline and <laughs> like how panic is her muse. And so I always think of that when I'm panicking, it makes me feel better. Sure. But Dan is great. He is, uh, he won a Pulitzer in his own right. He's a great journalist and he's very witty. I love the names he would pick. I, I love putting fake names in my, well, real names for fake <laughs> characters in my columns. And Dan was the king of that. He would name girls like Murgatroyd and <laughs> funny, specific. Yeah, he he kind of reminded me of Mike Royko, mm -hmm. whose, whose column I was glued to until he passed away. Yes, Mike Royko is another great one. So many good columnists. You're muted, David. Oh, also, Andy Rooney. Um, mm -hmm. used to columnist and then 60 Minutes, very simple, you know, he was a funny writer, very, could be very sarcastic too. Mm -hmm. um, do you know John Romano very well? John's yeah, a very John. good uh, sports writer, columnist. Yes, he wrote, he had the Metro column spot for many years and he wanted to go back to sports. So one of the nice thing about the times is that, you know, they're, my experience anyway has been that we're very willing to to hear people out and let them try things and go to where they're really feeling called, you know, um, and John is flourishing in sports and loves it. Um, and then I'm sort of in his role, but not really. So yeah, um, he's a great guy. He's a good writer. In terms of uh, big picture journalism and the role and the future of print media, how uh, the Tampa Times seems to have uh, been pretty uh, agile and uh, able to uh, do well in the last decade. I know there was a huge layoff about five or six years ago, 
how has the ship stabilized and how is the mood? Um, we've had more than one layoff. We've had many rounds and that's actually one of the reasons I didn't want to be a manager anymore because I had to lay people off and some of them were my good friends, you know. So it's it's business decisions and it's hard and it's it's not about talent anymore, you know. <laughs> it's like down to the bone some of the time and it's just difficult. Um, but we, I appreciate that you said agile. I think we're trying. Um, Paul Tash just retired last week and we have a new CEO uh, leading the ship who's been with us for several years now. And, you know, I think it's all about adapting and trying to really bring readers with us, you know, and attract a new generation of readers um, who maybe have never picked us up before. We have a ton of new residents who are flocking here, as you all know. And, um, you know, a lot of people ask about the print paper and they really mourn that because they love having a physical paper in their hand. And I understand that. And it's, and it, it is sad that it's not available as much anymore. What I always tell people, and some people don't even know that they can get us completely online. You know, some people who've never held a physical paper before, but get all their news on an app or on a phone or a, a laptop. We are on, you know, on tampabay.com. We post I think it's something like 90 stories a day and it's from, you know, five in the morning until late at night and there's no waiting until the next day to get your sports scores or whatever, you know, like the, the physical print paper is just a, a fraction of the news that we produce and it's, you know, the, the digital version is a, a sliver of the cost. It's better for the environment and it's current and it's up to date and it's available to you 24 hours a day. And so I think that's really the messaging that we need to to get to people and we're trying different formats. Um, I mentioned my newsletter. Newsletters have been very popular for us because it's kind of, you know, when you have your physical paper, you like my column is usually on that stick on the left. You So you know where to go every day or every time you get it. The newsletters to me are sort of like that. You know, it's a curated place where you know you're gonna get whoever you're signing up for. We have a, a newsletter called the Day Starter which goes out every day and it's a curation of our top news for that day. So it's almost like reading a paper, except it's in an email that gets sent to you. And there's a list of 25 of the top stories and, you know, a little explanation of them. Um, so we're just trying different formats to get, you know, the, the message is the same. You know, there's always going to be a need for information. It's just how do we get that to people? And then how do we get them to pay for it? Because, you know, whenever somebody says, oh, I wanted to read your story, but I, I hit the paywall, I always just say like, oh, I'm so sorry. It's we just we love to eat and feed our families <laughs> I get really embarrassed <laughs> then, you know I had a friend ask me once like what what news would you suggest I get that I I don't want to pay and I you know I let him sit with it for a minute and I was like you know buddy you should really think about paying for news um you know you pay for every other service you use and he he was very eviscerated and contrite and then he paid for news, you know, so getting that message out to people, letting them know we have a quality product that's available to them digitally all day, that you don't have to wait for your daily paper, um, is the next challenge ahead, I think. And we're climbing the hill. You're muted again, Dave. I know. Oh, I, I know my <laughs> computer keeps telling me AOL is coming in and everything. So I didn't want to be disturbing. Um, anybody else have any questions? How's no? your father doing? He's good. He's got some health challenges, but he's hanging in there. Good. He's sarcastic. <laughs> so funny. Well, I want to thank you, Stephanie, very much for accepting and uh, being here at the uh, this was our first one in a few weeks. So uh, it was nice to get back and see everybody and have you here. And uh, we all really do appreciate your time and, and uh, taking the time to come to our Zoom lunch. I appreciate you having me. Thank you all. It's nice to meet okay. you. I'm going to get your book me. too. Okay. Thank you so <laughs> all much. All right. We can okay. all stay on for a little bit. Stephanie, take care. Thanks again. Okay. All right. Bye-bye, Stephanie.